I've raised over $5 million for my own startup. And before that, I spent three years at one of the top VC firms. And the number one thing that I hated was just how much people gatekept how to actually raise money for your startup idea. And so today, we're gonna step into the Shark Tank. And I'm gonna walk you through step-by-step step every single detail of how I raised $5 million for my own startup idea so that one day you can do the same. Now, the number one question you're probably asking yourself right now is, well, I don't actually know any investors or people with a ton of money, so how do I even get in contact with these people? So step number one here is finding your Mark Cuban. Now, that might actually literally be Mark Cuban, but either way, I'm gonna teach you how to find your people, and then more importantly, how to send them an email that they actually wanna to respond to. And that all starts with creating your dream list of investors who will actually invest in you. Now, what I mean by that is finding people who truly get your vision. And so how I started doing that was I literally just pulled up my laptop and I looked for all of the best VCs or venture capital investors in my space, which my space is the creator economy. So I looked up all the biggest companies in the space, all of the legacy incumbent companies that had been funded. And I just went to a website like Crunchbase, which you can go to for free online. And I just started looking up all the companies and you start to see patterns in who the top investors are in any given space. Space. For example, if you're in crypto, then Andreessen Horowitz kind of dominates. If you're in consumer, then Forerunner dominates. And if you're in AI, which is a new and budding field, I actually think Nat Grossman's fund is actually really kind of interesting. The other thing you're going to start to see is that there's actually three main buckets of kinds of investors who might invest in your company. Now, those are angel investors, traditional venture capitalists, and then corporate VCs or corporate venture capitalists. And what's really important as you put together this dream list of investors is to be super thoughtful around which buckets you actually want to include because they all have their pros and cons. So for example, if you're really early stage in your startup idea or you're just starting to build your business, then I'm a huge proponent of bringing on angel investors onto your cap table. Specifically, angel investors who can add some sort of strategic or thoughtful value to your company at this stage. Because an angel investor is generally someone who just has a ton of money. So that's an individual who might be friends or family, who is maybe a former founder in your space, or is just someone who's really well known, like a Mark Cuban or an Arian Huffington or Steph Curry, someone who just has a lot of connections because they, in your early stages, oftentimes love being a mentor as an individual and then helping you scale to the next level. And so for me, because I'm in the creator economy, aka the new Hollywood, I was super intentional about bringing on Michael Ovitz, the founder of CAA, which is the biggest Hollywood agency out there, onto my cap table as an angel investor because he has so many connections within new and old Hollywood, and he can also help introduce me to a bunch of awesome potential teammates. Because from there, when you start to hear about people raising millions of dollars for their startup, so in my case, $5 million for my startup, that's when you start to pull in the traditional venture capitalists. And this is where you start to hear about funds or firms like Sequoia Capital, or four ventures or benchmark capital where these VCs are looking to find early stage startups and invest in them for a couple million dollars and then turn them into the next Uber or Airbnb or Facebook and generate billions of dollars in returns. And so these traditional VCs are a little bit different from that last bucket here that we call corporate VCs or corporate venture capitalists, aka the venture capital arm of large corporations like a Google or a Goldman Sachs. These kinds of VCs make a ton of sense for your startup idea if there's some sort of strategic angle. So for for example, if you're building in fintech, having Goldman's venture arm actually invest in you to create a banking partner and create this institutional credibility around you is actually a huge value add. So now that you've put together your dream list of investors here, now comes the hard part, step number two, which is actually reaching out to them and getting them to respond to you. So first off, a warm introduction is always gonna work best, where let's say you know a friend who knows a friend who's an investor and then this friend can introduce you. But I'm gonna go and assume that you don't know anyone and walk you through my rules for cold email hours reach that's actually gotten me responses from people like Mark Cuban. So first off, the golden rule here before sending any email ever is to put yourself in the shoes and in the head of whoever you're sending your email to. So in this case, we're going to put ourselves in the head of an imaginary VC. Let's call them Mark. So think about what it's like to be Mark, where every day you're getting thousands of emails from people begging you for money. So if you're sending an email that's super robotic or super generic and hasn't been well researched, do you think that Mark is gonna to respond to you? You've gotta keep in mind that these investors or VCs are heavily biased people who want to immediately know that you've done your research and you're worth their time. And what that means is you're playing to the two things that they actually care about. Number one is that you're gonna make them a lot of money, and then number two, you're gonna be great for their big egos. 
And so y'all, as you think about sending Mark an email, please do not send an email that looks like this with a generic subject line, a super long wall of text here with no clear personalization whatsoever, where to me, it's just really clear as the investor receiving this, that you just decided to mass blast this to 50 people rather than really doing your research on me and what value I can actually offer your company. But the worst part actually about this email here is that there's actually no sense for the traction of your business today. Okay, you have not actually laid out any proof points of how successful your company has been to date so that I can actually make the decision, okay, there's traction here. That actually leads me to want to learn more and potentially invest. And so instead, I want you to write an email with a personalized subject line in this case. And I'll throw up actually a couple of different sample subject lines you can use and alternate. But then from there, you're clearly showing you've done your research. So for example, for Mark, maybe you found that Mark has invested in a ton of other companies in this particular space that you really respect. And maybe you've also read one of their blog posts that you have a couple quick thoughts on. But notice how this email is still much more well-structured, much more concise, and you're using bullet points to quickly address your credibility as to why you are worth Mark's time, whether that's your background, whether that's how successful your company has been so far, even if it's just like really limited traction because you just started out. And then lastly, after you sold them on the vision of just how large your company is gonna be one day, you have some sort of clear call to action as a next step. Cold hard reality that I need to prep you for. <laughs> For every 10 emails you send, you're only gonna get one or two responses. <laughs> and you can complain that this is way too hard, but the reality is that any entrepreneur worth their weight who's actually going to succeed in building a business, which is really freaking hard, is going to figure out some way to get a couple investors to respond to their cold emails. And so at this point, you've sent hundreds of emails to investors and you've maybe gotten a couple responses. And now you're in so deep that they've said yes, so you gotta crush it from here and raise some money, which all starts with building an incredible pitch deck. So I'm just gonna walk you through the exact pitch deck that I used to raise $5 million. Now, as I was creating this pitch deck, I was once again putting my head into the shoes of investor. Is that the right term? putting myself into the shoes of the investors. And so as I was building out this pitch deck, I was basically going through the checklist that any investor goes through in their head when they're diligencing a new opportunity, which is number one, the main question that they're trying to answer is, will this be a billion dollar outcome and make me lots of money and give me lots of street cred? And that starts from a couple underlying building blocks. Number one is, is this market sufficiently large enough? Is it a massive addressable market that actually, if you solve this problem, you'll make a ton of money. So as an example, Airbnb is going after the entire travel, vacation, hotel space. It is a multi, multi-billion dollar space. Of course, if they solved that problem back in the day, that would be a really large outcome. And so after you take the time to establish just how large this market opportunity is, that's then where you start to talk about where the cracks are showing in this market, aka the problem in this market, where for me with Stan, before Stan, if you were a creator or an online entrepreneur and you just wanted to build a storefront to sell your products, you had to patch together a link in bio, a website, a course provider, a checkout process, an email provider, like all these things, and spend hundreds of dollars a month on that until I built Stan for my own account and therefore all of our customers as well, where basically you have now a one-stop shop as your online storefront. And so once you present the solution to this massive problem and this massive market that you're gonna go solve, that then opens up the conversation with the investor around the rest of the things that they care about, which is really around competitive differentiation and why you specifically are gonna win. And so I spend a meaningful amount of time in my specific pitch deck talking about the competition because the reality is that in my space, there were tons of competitors who'd raise way more funding than we'll ever hopefully ever raise. And I had to justify really clearly why we specifically were gonna win. And so that takes the form of a couple different angles. Number one, I was just showing them my traction to date as a proof point of the fact that we could actually be successful. But then from there, I talk a lot about our strategic vision and our angle specifically on the market, how we're gonna take it over over time. And then you pair that lastly with, I think one of the most important slides in your pitch deck at the early stages, which is why specifically you. Because at the end of the day, all early stage VCs know that a early stage bet is really as much on the founders of a business as it is on the strategic rationale or the product differentiation of such an early stage product. And so for me, I did everything possible to establish myself as a credible founder within this space because I am my own customer and therefore I can reach what a lot of VCs call founder market fit. Also guys, you know my mission here is to give you a free business education that's better than 
any of those Honcho Poncho Ivy League schools. So if you do want to use my pitch deck as a reference, you can download it completely for free below. So at this point, you've now faced hundreds of rejections. You have an awesome pitch deck. And finally, someone has said yes to potentially meeting with you. AKA, it is time to step into the Shark Tank and have your very first pitch meeting. And y'all, I cannot tell you how nervous I was stepping into my first few pitch meetings, but my advice here is to start with your elevator pitch, AKA a concise 30 second to two minute story on why you, and then start practicing that with all of your friends and all the people you look up to in the business world. Because what you need to realize is that practice makes perfect when it comes to nerves and meetings like these, where in general for a first round pitch meeting, it's this casual conversation meets pitch presentation kind of all together, where you're gonna get on to let's say a Zoom call or meet this VC in person, and you're gonna to start to get to know each other kind of like a casual interview, but then you're gonna start diving into your pitch over time. And so that's why it's really critical to not be nervous in the same way that in a regular sales meeting or in an interview, you don't really wanna be nervous and you definitely don't wanna come across as desperate. And so what I did to prepare was I caught up all of my smartest business friends and asked them to sit down with me for a pitch where I pitched them my startup ideas and then I just had them wreck me, where basically my ask of them was to ask all of the questions and grill me in any way possible that they could so that I could understand the objections or concerns that they had. And I started writing those out once there was a clear pattern. And then I was able to be prepared for when I actually met with VCs to answer those tough questions. But I don't want you to take advice just from me. So instead, we're gonna call in a VC from a top VC firm here, specifically R. Malek. She is a partner at Craft Ventures to actually give us her take on what actually leads to a great pitch meeting. And by the way, she has absolutely no idea that I'm about to FaceTime her right now, so we'll see if she even picks up. Hi, quick question for you, how are you doing? Hey, John, nice to see you. <laughs> it's great to see you as well, thank you for picking up. Um, so one question for you, really quick one, yeah. which is what are the factors that lead to a great pitch meeting for a first time founder? I think founders should just try to relax, um, and just talk about their company really like directly and thoughtfully. Um, and then I'd say, I personally love when founders have natural pauses in their pitch so I can jump in with questions and then that'll make it feel like a more natural conversation and hopefully take some of the pressure off the pitch. And I love just getting direct answers and versus like getting a whole pitch mm. and then having to wait till the end and keeping track of my questions. That's helpful. So it's kind of like a conversation as opposed to like a one-way dialogue. Exactly. I think a lot of people watch the show Shark Tank, which is awesome and gives really great exposure to the venture capital and startup uh, ecosystem. But the one thing that's awkward about it is that people think a pitch is you speaking for three minutes straight nonstop and then investors asking you questions, but really it should just be a natural conversation from the start. I love that. And then last question for you actually is when you think about a company you get excited about that's investable, what are kind of the key things you're looking for? A really great founder and um, solid team. Um, hopefully they have some industry experience or a connection to the product that they're building so that you really feel like they're the experts and they're the right person to build that. And then a huge market and um, hopefully some, some early traction that helps you believe that they have product market fit. Cool. Thank you so much for the advice. Of course. So Ari gave some really good advice there around how to run an actually effective pitch meeting, which first starts with just taking a deep breath and relaxing, which of course is much easier said than done. But really what she emphasized and I think is super important is to make sure to have a fluid conversation as opposed to just like a one-way pitch dialogue. And that fluid dialogue where the VC is asking you questions while you're answering them actually is super important for another reason, which is that you get a better sense of how genuinely enthusiastic they are because they're constantly asking questions and maybe they're adding in while they're excited because that signal is super, super important for that next step of this pitch meeting is for you to figure out whether or not they're actually genuinely interested in investing in your company. Because when you think about this like VC investor versus entrepreneur pitch process, it's kind of like a dance, right? It's you're trying to guess what the other partner is thinking. It's, it's almost like a dating process. You're trying to figure out if they like you. And so you need all of these signals, as many signals as possible, to figure out how you can catalyze a potential next meeting. And so honestly, sometimes that takes the form of at the end of the meeting, trying to get as much direct feedback as possible, like asking some form of the question, so 
what do you think? Because this feedback at the end is so important. Number one, for just understanding whether or not they're actually interested in investing, so whether or not you should catalyze the process. But number two, if they're not actually interested, getting their candid feedback on why is super important for you to actually make sure you close a different investor. Because if this investor who isn't interested and rejects you, gives you feedback on why they're not interested, you can start to iterate through that feedback and improve on that in your company and in your pitch over time. AKA all these rejections you're going through are only worth it if you're actually learning from them and improving from them or else it's just pain. Cold hard reality number two. You are going to get rejected after these pitch meetings so many times. I was rejected dozens of times before my first yes and the founder of Canva literally got hundreds of no's before she got her first yes and she now runs a $35 billion company. So this is your reminder to just persist where the no's are just signals and information to eventually get you to that first yes. And so as you think about the cases where someone does say yes, I'd love to keep the conversation going, this is where we need to talk about the really critical process of how do you catalyze an investment or a deal out of someone who's interested in your company. And basically how this process goes from here is the VC will actually report to their team, hey, you know, I met this really interesting company. I'd love to learn more. I'd love to think about what an investment looks like. And then on your end, what you're looking to do is catalyze future meetings with this specific VC to help them learn more about your business and get them even more excited to invest. And this is the period that we call diligence, where the VC is really gonna try to dive into your numbers, any metrics you have, as well as start doing reference checks on the market, right? If they're interested in investing in your company, think about what they're gonna go do. They're gonna start calling all of your customers, all the other potential customers in this market, they're gonna call your competitors, they're gonna to try to learn everything possible about this market to understand where you fit in and whether or not you are a good investment. And so in order to be best prepared for this proctology exam of a diligence process with all these VCs, Basically what I did was I prepped as many metrics as I could possibly. So it was a really early stage idea. I only had three months of traction. So I made sure to have all of my metrics and financials that I did have ready to go. But then on top of that, I had a bunch of customers who absolutely loved the early versions of Stan, ready to talk to my VCs and sell them on how much they love Stan and how much potential there was in this market. And then I layered that on top of one other thing that is so, 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 so critical for closing an investment in your company. And that is building urgency and tension into your investment process. Basically, the number one mistake that I see too many entrepreneurs do in their fundraising process is they don't create urgency in their pitch and investment process. AKA they have some sort of open-ended infinite timeline on the fundraise. Because when you think about a VC investor who has no deadline in giving you any sort of decision, they're gonna keep meandering along in terms of making more diligence or actually even coming to a conclusion because they have no forcing function on when they actually need to give you an answer. And I will never forget what one of my former VC partners told me, which is that time is the killer of all deals. And so what I made sure to do as the founder running this investment process was get a lead horse bidder as soon as possible. AKA, I found one firm that was super excited about our vision and what we were doing so far and got them to submit an offer in order to lock us down and then use that to actually accelerate offers from the rest of the market, where I was able to say to all of our other investors we were considering working with, hey, we have this offer at a certain valuation, in this case for us was $25 million from a top firm. We'd love to, however, explore also working with you as a potential partner, but we have a two week deadline on this term sheet here before it explodes. And so this is what I mean by tension, where when there's a limited constraint here, as well as the credibility provided of someone having given you an offer, all the other investors are kind of like a feeding frenzy and they have this thing called FOMO or the fear of missing out. So for us, I actually liked a bunch of the investors we were talking to because they all had different pros and cons to them. And so I actually built a syndicate of a couple different investment firms where I was able to go to our lead investor, Yuri, and say, hey, Yuri, look, I've really loved meeting you. I love the values and mission you and your firm live by. I also think we just get along really, really well. I'd love to work with you as our lead investor, but we have this other offer to $25 million valuation that explodes in two weeks. If you can get there at the same valuation, I'm super personally happy with that. I would love to sign on the dot with you as our lead. And then I can bring in all these other wonderful investors to co-invest as co-investment partners behind you. And these kinds of conversations are super, super critical for you to do one thing that a lot of founders don't do, which is making sure to pick the right partner. Because when you think about the life cycle of a VC company relationship, 
It's unfortunately, if your company is successful, longer than most marriages. And the reason why so many founders make this mistake of not diligencing their VCs is because we're all just so excited to hopefully be done with the process and raise money and move on and actually build our companies. But it is so, so, so critical to actually realize that not all investors are created equal. You need to make sure this person has strong values, strong integrity, is a true thought partner through the ups and the inevitable downs that are gonna come with building your company so that you can actually trust that they will be there when you are struggling and be a real partner in your business. Because once you find that right committed partner for you, it's really just about finalizing the investment agreement from there and then getting to the absolute best part of the process, which is getting your funds wired to you. And that there is where the real hard work starts, where now you actually have to take that money and go build an incredible company and make a return for your investors. And so if you are at all interested in what it's like to actually work with a VC post-investment and the journey of building a billion dollar company, we actually live recorded one of our meetings that we had, a board meeting I had with my lead investor, Yuri, that I'll put somewhere over here uh, that you can watch and see how it goes. All right, guys, so I covered a ton here, but if there's truly one thing that you take away from all of this, it's actually none of this tactical detail here. It's just to literally never, ever, 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 ever quit. Because that is the one thing that I've seen separates all the founders who've been successful, not only in raising money for their business, but also building a successful business. And so all that being said, I believe in you, you should believe in you, and I will see you on the other side.